our video lesson today, we'll be talking about models of the atom. Really uh, just a story of who said what about the atom along a timeline, kind of an evolutionary period as we learned more and more about the atom and watched the um, atomic theory evolve with better and better technology. So the story of how the atomic theory has evolved over time. This slide reads section 13.1. That would be from our orange chemistry book from the honors chem level. In our white AP chemistry, this corresponds to chapter 6 and 7 in our white AP books. You have in front of you the note pack that reads electrons and atoms and chemical periodicity. The title is chapter 13 and 14 which would be found in our orange chemistry books. Not a big deal just letting you know that the chapter numbers, page numbers do not correspond with the AP books. They correspond to the honors chem books but the lesson is indeed the same. Let's go ahead and begin thinking about um, in terms of who said what about the atom. We're going to start with our first set of notes on page two of our new note pack and we're going to look at John Dalton followed by J.J. Thompson, Ernest Rutherford, and Niels Bohr. And as we look at the slides together, I'm asking you that you just briefly describe how the following people viewed the atom. And I wrote down uh, probably a lot of detail and asking you to summarize from that. The first person really to give us the modern atomic theory would be John Dalton. He had four key ideas about the atom. He said that all elements are composed of tiny indivisible particles known as the atom. The atom literally means in Greek uh, indivisible, cannot be broken down any further. Well friends that's actually a new concept in terms of uh, chemistry at that particular time. We thought matter could be divided continuously. So the Democritus versus um, Aristotle of the Greek philosophers in the time were, were considering continuity versus indivisibility. We now agree that all elements have this basic building block called the atom. All atoms of the same element are identical, reads bullet number two. And I'm going to pause and make you think about that. From our chemistry class, we now know the second bullet is not true simply because of the word isotopes. Isotopes. That might be a very important word to write down next to this second bullet. Atoms of the same element are identical. That was back in the uh, 1800s when John Dalton first started to describe the atom. But since, again, technology and, and uh, the evolution of the atomic theory, we now understand that atoms of the same element can differ by the number of neutrons and still be considered the same element. That word is called isotopes. The third bullet, all atoms of different elements are different. And that's still true since it's the number of protons that gives the atom its identity. If I vary the proton, I've changed the identity of the atom. The next bullet, atoms combine chemically with one another in simple whole number ratios. That's still proven to be true. The whole number ratio that we're referring to is by a mole ratio and I can simplify that bullet by simply reminding us that subscripts are always whole number ratios. We'll never have a fraction, we'll never have a decimal for a whole, uh, for a subscript. And the last bullet of John Dalton, his contribution to the atomic theory, during chemical reaction atoms are separated joined or rearranged. Atoms can never be created or destroyed. We now know this to be the law of conservation of mass. The amount of materials that we start with, called reactants, must indeed be accounted for at the product side. Atoms cannot be created nor destroyed. And if we think about our knowledge of chemical change, we have these starting materials called reactants. Their bonds break. Those uh, atoms rearrange themselves to form new compounds known as products. So law of conservation of mass. Well, along comes, uh, I'm going to say within his lifetime, 20 some years later, a student named J.J. Thompson. And Thompson proposed yet another version of what an atom looks like. J.J. Thompson 
His model is known as the plum pudding model. Now to me, I can't necessarily picture what plum pudding looks like, so I call it a chocolate chip cookie model. That I can envision with no worries. Think about a chocolate chip cookie and what do you see? Well, you see the dough area that might be cooked and brown, and scattered throughout in a random order are the chocolate chips. Simply put, those electrons randomly dispersed within this positive dough area is what J.J. Thompson proposed an atom to look like. So just as the chocolate chips stuck in a cookie dough, the electrons were stuck in this lump of positively charged material. Now let's make sense of what this evolution did. Dalton did not know anything about subatomic particles. He believed that an atom is the smallest thing, that indivisible particle. That was later proven false when we discovered things like protons, neutrons, and the tiny particle known as an electron. As we made those discoveries, we started to figure out where those uh, particles were organized. What did that atom look like? It didn't look like a solid sphere that Dalton thought of. If I think of a Dalton model, it might look like a, like a solid marble, and the, the marbles would be indivisible. They are the basic building block of matter, but they are made of something smaller. And that's what Thompson's contribution did. He didn't know about protons and neutrons, but he certainly started to address the arrangement of these um, particles known as electrons, randomly dispersed throughout, kind of like a chocolate chip cookie. The third person we should be aware of in this evolution story of what an atom looks like is called Ernest Rutherford. And this man did a great deal of work um, discovering the nucleus of the atom. The nucleus is so tiny compared to the size of an overall atom, and yet it contains most of the mass. Now think about this. Put yourself in the center of a football field, just standing there at the 50-yard line. You would represent the size of the nucleus of an atom if you were the size of, the, of a pinhead, the size of the head of a pin standing there at the 50-yard line. And you look down at the end zone before you see the first electron nearest you. Place a pin at a 50-yard line and consider looking at the end of the uh, football field before you even see the next particle. And yet the entire mass of the atom concentrate, concentrates itself right there in the center of the football field. This is an analogy. Ernest Rutherford decided through the um, use of Actually, it was uh, radioactive plates and shooting alpha particles through a piece of tissue paper that was made of gold. We can talk more about that specific experiment uh, in a little bit. But he discovered the nucleus through this experimental procedure. Here it shows that most of the atom's mass is concentrated in a small, positively charged region he called the nucleus. Itty bitty compared to the size of the atom. We knew the electrons resided outside. We had this positive core and a negative region outside. He did not understand how the electrons were arranged, but he decided it didn't look like a chocolate chip cookie where they were evenly just randomly dispersed throughout the positive region. But he, he placed the positive region in the center and placed the negative electrons around it. It was actually his student, his uh, student, uh, graduate student, his name was Niels Bohr, who then probably the most familiar model of an atom that uh, we have grown up with, arranged these electrons in a concentric circular path called orbits around the nucleus. If you've ever drawn a solar system model or a planetary model for an atom, you've drawn a Bohr model for the atom. With the first ring around the nucleus, we placed two dots for the first two electrons. We drew a second ring around the nucleus that had up to eight more electrons. We drew a third ring in the nucleus that had up to eight more electrons. And there's reasons why it goes two, eight, and eight. But I'm hoping to jog some memory from your physical science days. Or friends, if it's a brand new concept, just realize that these little rings that we draw around the nucleus and start placing little electrons in, 
um, was a Bohr model of the atom. And it's a great model that works well for a lot of things, but it so does not look like an atom. We have such a better understanding of the modern atomic theory, the currently accepted model called the quantum mechanical model. That's the three words you're going to fill in the blank, quantum mechanical model. This was actually a physicist, his name was Erwin Ir Schrodinger, with the help of quantum mechanical math and described areas of probability of finding an electron. We have to take the scope of our understanding of an atom and rock its world. Atoms with this tiny center core do not place their electrons around centers like a planet system. I don't draw a circle and place two dots and have them orbit. I don't draw a second ring and place up to eight more drop dots and have them orbit. Atoms do not look like that. We have to talk about a three-dimensional view known as the quantum mechanical model. Here's a good analogy. If I have a, a three-blade fan on off, I can see the individual blades of the fan. They're not moving. Of course I can see them. Turn that fan on full blast. Turn it up on high. And those fan blades move at such momentum that they appear to be everywhere at once, giving this cloud-like appearance. That's the best way to start viewing electrons, except now we view them in a specific three-dimensional shape of a cloud. It's a mathematical model that uses quantum mechanics. That's a field of mathematics well beyond the scope of this course, well beyond the scope of uh, any calculus course. It introduces the idea of probabilities of finding an electron at any given instant in an area that we call electron clouds. It introduces the ideas that there are principal energy levels and in each principal energy level there are sublevels of energies. And these sublevels of energies contain what are called electron orbitals, electron clouds, if you will, that take on very specific geometric shapes. We have to move beyond a specific two dimensional flat model that looks like rings around a circle called the nucleus and put it into our mind that atoms are three dimensional in shape and those different shaped clouds are now given letters to denote their shape. The electron cloud shapes are denoted by the following letters S, P, D, and F subatomic orbitals. They stand for S spherical, P principal, D is diffuse, and F is fundamental. Those four letters tell us the shapes of the clouds. Those clouds are called atomic orbitals. Those orbitals reside in principal energy levels. Principal energy level one has one sublevel, an S-shaped cloud, and so forth. When I think about quantum mechanical model, there are some tie-ins with the Bohr model. The Bohr model also had principal energy levels, but we just simply place dots in those little rings to call those electrons. That principal energy level has a quantum number denoted as n, the principal energy level. The principal energy level refers to the major region where electrons are most likely to be found, and their assigned values an order of increasing energy. n equal 1, n equal 2, n equal 3, etc. Now think of a Bohr model, a solar system model, where we're used to placing in the center is called a nucleus that contains protons and neutrons. We would then draw a first ring. That's now the first principal energy level, n equal 1, up to two electrons. If you draw a second ring around that nucleus, 
again sticking with the Bohr model to make a connection, that second ring is now n equal to the principal energy level of 2. Draw a third ring, it's the third principal energy level. That's a tie-in from the Bohr model. Quantum mechanical model still keeps this idea. The expansion, the new knowledge, inside of these little rings that we were drawing called principal energy levels <clears throat> are now sublevels. And these sublevels take on different shapes based on the probability of their cloud. This term sublevel within each principal energy level the electrons occupy sublevels. The number of sublevels within each principal energy level is the same as the principal quantum number. So for instance, in a Bohr model, and when I say Niels Bohr, the Bohr model, think solar system, the planetary model that we grew up with from, from middle school days. Protons and neutrons packed in the center and we would draw a ring around it, n equal 1. That first energy level has one sublevel. It looks like a spherical shaped cloud. It's denoted with the letter S. Draw a second ring in the planetary model. We call that the principal energy level 2, n equal 2. There are two sublevels, an S and a P-shaped cloud. Third energy level, third ring around. In our mind, we've got to start expanding what it looks like. It has three different sublevels, an S, a P, and a D-shaped cloud. Finally, the last bullet on this slide, how many sublevels does the fourth principal energy level have? Well, of course, we'd say four, an S, a P, a D, and an F-shaped orbital. Those letters, S, P, D, F, tell us the sublevel. They are indicating the shape of the cloud. Let's repeat. Atomic orbitals on the bottom of page 2. The bottom of page 2 of your note pack is what I'm referring to. We defined a principal energy level as the major region where electrons are most likely to be found. In the Bohr model, they correspond to the rings around the nucleus we drew in a planetary model. But now we're still assigning them energy level values, but we're expanding the idea that now we have sublevels, letter B of our note pack. Within each principal energy level, we occupy sublevels. The number of sublevels at each principal energy level is the same as the principal quantum number. Principal energy level 1 has one sublevel. Principal energy level 2 has two sublevels. Principal energy level 3, three sublevels. Principal energy level 4 has four sublevels. And so forth. The sublevels are denoted with the letters S, P, D, and F. Those are going to be shown to us in a moment as shaped clouds. So when I refer to these atomic orbitals, atomic orbitals where electrons reside giving a specific three-dimensional shape around the nucleus. These atomic orbitals are regions in which the electrons move in a very specific mathematical form. The letters that denote them, S, S-shaped clouds. They're denoted with, they look like little spherical round areas. P-shaped clouds are hourglass in shape. D-shaped clouds are cloverleaf shaped. And there is an F-shaped cloud, but they're pretty complex to draw, so I'm not going to ask that you take the time to sketch them in your note pack. However, take a good look at them. The four letters used to denote atomic orbitals, and again, atomic orbitals, where electrons are most likely to be found within the principal energy level. 
the four letters are S, P, D, and F. An S-shaped cloud is spherical. A P-shaped cloud looks like an hourglass. A D-shaped cloud has a four-leaf clover shape. In our note pack, we have room to draw those. I'm asking you to sketch the following. Best you can. I'm no artist. Let's take a peek. Where it says S-shape, in your note pack, this is what I would draw. This is a three-dimensional axis from geometry. Remember how you had to draw an X, Y, Z axis to denote three dimensions? Two are flat on the paper, the X and the Y, but the Z is coming straight out at you. If I draw a sphere, a sphere shaped, it's going to be completely encompassing an X, Y, Z axis in all directions equally. Draw an X, Y, Z axis and place a sphere and you've drawn the shape of an S-shaped cloud. Notice there is only one spatial orientation for the S-shaped cloud. Take a look at the second and it's in yellow. These look like an hourglass. Some people say a figure eight or a barbell. Draw an X, Y, Z axis three times because see the P-shaped clouds have three possible spatial orientations. In the first, the hourglass is aligning itself on the x-axis. One way to spatially align itself is on the x-axis. This is denoted as the P sub x orbital. The P sub y orbital aligns its hourglass shaped cloud along the y axis and the z shaped p sub z shaped aligns itself on the z axis. The s shaped cloud has one spatial orientation, one way to align itself in a three dimensional world. The p's looking like hourglasses have three possible spatial orientations, a P sub X, a P sub Y, a P sub Z. I ask you to draw best you can, I'm no artist, perhaps you want to copy from your text, the five spatial orientations of the D. What you're really doing is aligning a four leaf clover four different ways around an X, Y, Z axis, but notice the center, the center is an hourglass with a ring around the center that is unique. There are five spatial orientations for the D sublevel. Here's the F sublevel. That's why I'm not asking you to draw these. These are too complex, but I would like us to walk away seeing that there are seven spatial orientations for the F sublevel. To review, each one of these specific drawings is called an atomic orbital. The S-shaped cloud has one orbital. The P-shaped clouds have three different orbitals, Px, Py, Pz. This is denoted as P negative one, P zero, P positive one, and we'll learn more about that when we get to quantum numbers. The D-shaped clouds have five different orbitals. D negative two, D negative one, D zero, D one, D two. All the numbers from negative two to positive two, including zero. That gives us five different spatial orientations. And the F-shaped clouds were not asked to draw. They have seven different orientations. You should pause the video here and spend as much time as you need to carefully draw the S, P, and D-shaped orbitals. You need to draw one for the S, three for the P, and five for the D. When that's accomplished, start this lesson again. You can see the lowest principal energy level is 1.
the first ring around the nucleus. It has only one sublevel. Principal energy level 1 with one sublevel is called the 1s orbital. In principal energy level 2, which with our solar system model would be the second ring, has two sublevels. They would be denoted as a 2s and a 2p sublevel. The s with its one spatial orientation and the p which has three spatial orientations. Keep in mind the 2p is of higher energy and consists of three different p orbitals, three spatial orientations. Let's show an easy way to remember the order of filling electrons. We call this the electron pyramid. This is fill in the blanks there on page 3. The s orbitals with one spatial orientation. Each one of those orbitals, each little diagram that you drew, can hold at most up to two electrons. Then it's full. The p orbitals have three spatial orientations. Each one of those orientations can hold up to two electrons before they're filled, giving us a total of six. The d orbitals with five spatial orientations can hold up to ten electrons, two in each one of these spatial orientations. Since there were seven spatial orientations for the f, they can hold up to fourteen electrons. This would be a good place to pause and digest the lesson so far. Ask yourself the following critical points. Can you describe the atomic theory according to Dalton, Thompson, Rutherford, Bohr, and the quantum mechanical model? Can you differentiate between a principal energy level and a sublevel? Do you know how many principal sublevel, excuse me, start that over, sorry. Do you know how many spatial orientations each sublevel has? the S, the P, the D, and the F. Can you picture them in your mind when you visually think of a three-dimensional view of the S, P, and D shaped clouds? When you've reached these critical points, you're ready to start Lesson 2, The Electron Arrangements in Atoms.